All right. Hello, everybody. How's everybody doing? Right. Happy Sunday. It's good to see all y'all's beautiful faces again. I'm sorry I wasn't here last week. Yeah, I missed y'all too. As you guys know, I was in Atlanta for my cousin's uh, birthday party. And I don't know if you guys could tell, I have a sty in my eye. So, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was way worse than what, what y'all see now. It looked like, I look like a monster, basically, a few days ago. So it went away now. So thank God it's getting back to normal. But I still look kind of weird. But anyways, if just in case you thought I got punched in the eye or something. That's, the, that's what it is. It's just a sty. All right, so as you guys know, we're still in Nehemiah chapter 3, so I didn't finish. Well, I'm, I, I was still in 3. <laughs> you guys moved to 4. Yeah, I wasn't ready for 4 yet. So um, as you guys know, you know, my dad's in Columbia, Tennessee now at St. Paul AME Church. Uh, Reverend La Dennis Lawson is y'all preacher now. So uh, I don't know if I'll still be doing Sunday school here. That's on you guys if you guys still want me to do it. We're going to pick a different day. I, there's no way I could do it Sunday at 9 a.m. Uh, so, uh, but anyways, um, if you guys want to keep in touch with me, you guys know I post on my social media pages all the time. I do the same thing on my social media pages. So, uh, my social media pages are here, so I'll give that to Brother Wayne, and you guys can go to it. If you're not on social media, go ahead and get on it, all right? You're missing out. Like, so, you, you don't need a YouTube account in order to see YouTube videos. I got, I'm on YouTube. You don't need to be subscribed to a podcast to see somebody's podcast. I'm on any podcast platform for the most part. And then Facebook, too. Like, I'm on Facebook all the time. You guys can DM me on Facebook to get in touch with me. Some of you guys got my numbers, but if you guys want my number, you can get it. And then also I'll be posting on my dad's social media pages as well. All you got to do is type in Reverend Frederick L. Jenkins Sr. on his YouTube or on his uh, Facebook, and you can get to him. But let's go ahead and close out Nehemiah Chapter 3. So, uh... There's so much to say with Nehemiah chapter 3, and there's no way to do it in one study. Like, because you guys know we talked about the 10 gates of Jerusalem when it came to Nehemiah chapter 3, and that's actually what the Sunday school book focused on. You know, Reverend uh, J. Vernon McGee, he focused on talking about the 10 gates of Jerusalem. Um, and he didn't really break down just all the gems and nuggets you can get from Nehemiah chapter 3. So, uh, I, you guys have been reading those verses, right? So I don't have to read it. There's a lot of names, a lot of repairs going on on the walls and the gates. And, um, yeah, so I'm not going to read it. So you guys know that's the whole chapter for the most part, right? So I'm going to break down certain things, pulling out certain things from that uh, when I talk. But let's go ahead and get to it. So God has a work going on in this world that needs to be done, right? God's at work 24-7. And in order to accomplish God's work, we need a plan. Everyone has to play their part. And people... Uh, have to serve no matter what their social status is, no matter what their class or their occupation is. And that's what we, the first thing we see in Nehemiah chapter 3, right? We saw that pr there's pre the, pr the performers, uh, performers, you know what I'm trying to say, people that do perfume, right? There's priests, there's Levites, there's women, there's children, there's governors, mayors, rulers, whatever you want to, however you want to slice it. All these people are coming together to help rebuild the walls around Jerusalem, right? No matter what their status is or their class or occupation. And, and some of them served more than once. Like, we see that the Tokiites, for example, even though they're nobles, like we talked about last Sunday school lesson, when I did it, in Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 5, we saw that the Tokiites, the, their nobles refused to do the work, but that didn't stop the Tokiites themselves as, as a people from doing the work, right? They lived five miles away, but they built two sections of the wall, even though their nobles refused to do the work, right? So they did more than what they had to do, basically, right? So reading through the chapter, one of the first things that we'll see is the whole process was a team effort, right? And I want to really hone in on that. It was a team effort. So it wasn't one person rebuilding the wall. And I want to throw out the story of Noah. Noah's a contradiction to this. Did, Noah help, did anybody help Noah build the wall? Maybe his family, his children, his wife. But did anybody else? And how long did it take Noah to rebuild the wall? I mean, now, how long did it take Noah to build the ark? 120 years. Imagine how less of time it would have took him if he would have had help. Right? <laughs> 120 years is a long time. Right? Then on top of that, the people in Nehemiah chapter 3, how long did it take Nehemiah to rebuild the wall to Jerusalem? Only 52 days because he had help. Right? So this is a God vision, a God dream. When it comes to God working, it takes all of us, right? We're the body of Christ, the church, right? D different members in the body. So if the walls and the gates 
were going to be rebuilt, then everyone will have to play their part. Everyone has a part to play. So now this is a picture of how the church is meant to operate, right? So we got, you know, Scott's Chapel got a new pastor now, right? So a lot of people expect in the Emmy church, I've been seeing this all my life. You guys see it too. You, you guys are older than me. A lot of times people expect the pastor to do everything while everybody else sit on a pew and, and just stay there and don't do anything. That's not the way the Christian life works. Like one time I did a, a video on my YouTube channel and it was called Don't Rob the Church of Your Gifts. Basically, don't hoard your spiritual gifts, right? And I was tying in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'll go ahead and read that verse in a bit. But basically, all of us have different giftings. All of us are different members in the body. We're all the body of Christ, right? We all make the body of Christ. So what sense does it make for the eye, if you're the eye, to, to say I'm not a part of the body, I'm not good enough, like I don't have no good things, I'm just going to stay right here and not do anything. What's going to happen to the whole body? The body ain't going to be able to see, right? <laughs> what if the left hand, you know, everybody's right-handed, most people are right-handed, right? What if you just disregarded your left hand and cut it off because I'm not left-handed, I don't need it? What? Like, what sense is that? <laughs> That's less things you can do with both hands, right? And there's some things that your left hand does that you're, that you're not even conscious of, right? That, that you actually need it for, right? You guys know what I'm saying? So every member in the body is important. So we all have different giftings, but it's for the edification of all. It's for the whole entire body, right? So everything we do in the church is not just for ourselves. A lot of people just live for themselves and live just to see for themselves. They live just to serve themselves. When, whenever the body operates, you know, your right hand feeds and nourishes the whole body when you eat, right? Because your right hand's moving and giving food, it's for the edification of all your body, the nutrition of all your body, right? So it's not just the right hand getting the glory, right? It's not just, the, it's not just one member doing all the work, right? And same thing in the church, right? We should, we should be operating using our gifts for the whole entire body. So I'm going to use the scripture verse for this. It's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 13. Uh, Paul said, and he and God gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service, to the building up the, of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to the mature man, to measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So God gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, preachers. Uh, he gave uh, singers. He gave ushers. He gave all these different members of the body. Why? For the equipping of the saints for the work of service. So we serve and we operate in our gifting. Why? So we can equip one another. So we can motivate one another. So we can edify one another. So we can give everybody the nutrition that each and every single person needs. Why? To the building up of the body of Christ. Right? This is Nehemiah chapter 3. Like, it's all these different members coming to be together, right? The, the giftings that people have are for the equipping of the saints in the work of service. This is what we learn from Nehemiah chapter 3. And also in Nehemiah chapter 3, we learn some may have been gifted in particular areas, and they were to work in those areas, but all helped in whatever way that they could, right? So when each group worked together building their section of the wall, it's similar to how each believer works together to help build up the body of Christ. So the body of Christ, the church, right? It's made up of all different kind of believers, all different kind of gifts, all different kind of members, right? And so what sense is it to discriminate against a member who's not like you? You know, what sense does it make to try to conform and try to make somebody into the member that you are? There's no sense, right? Because you don't try to get your pinky to be like your middle finger. They do two different things, right? You don't try to get your big, what sense would it make for your pinky toe a lot of people do this. Like, let's give an analogy, right? I did this on my YouTube channel. Like, the foot, right? Some members are hidden for a reason, right? Imagine if my pinky toe was like, I'm tired of being hidden in a shoe. Nobody gets to see me, right? I'm going to be on the face. I'm going to put myself on the forehead of the face so everybody can see me and I can get the glory. What sense does that make? Like, you know, like, some people operate like that in the Christian body. We're the body of Christ, right? This church is a body of Christ. So what sense does it make for a member to do things outside of the way that God called them to serve the whole entire body, right? God, God doesn't operate like that, right? So we need to be better in how we're going to operate in the church, right? So by using the gifts and abilities believers have been given, the church is strengthened and built up. So I read Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 13, but let me read Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16, so a few verses after that. 
It said, Paul said, for him, the whole body joined, to get, joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So it's not, you're not loving the whole entire body. You're not loving God and Christ. If you don't worry about the whole edification of the whole entire body, you don't join together and hold each other up as supporting ligaments and grow in faith and build each other up in love as each part does its work, right? So if you're not doing your function, if you're not doing and operating the way God called you to operate in the body of Christ in this work, right? You Apparently you don't love God, right? And you're not doing your part. Everybody has a part to play. Everybody has a role to play. And this is what we see in Nehemiah chapter 3. Let's, let's get some examples. In Nehemiah chapter 3 verse 8, right? Let's go to this verse right here. It says, and next to him, Han and I, one of the performers, made repairs. And they restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall, right? So a, per, a performer, right? person who does perfume. It's also another word in the King James Version. I'm not going to worry about saying it. But, um... Basically, in verse 8, it talks about performers, and it talks about uh, goldsmiths, people. So what does a goldsmith and a performer have to do with rebuilding a wall or rebuilding a gate? Nothing. Like, they don't, that's not their craft. That's not what they're called to do. That's not what their function is. They have soft hands, and they're used to doing soft work. They're not used to doing late, hard labor like that and getting their hands dirty, right? But yet the performers and the uh, goldsmiths help to rebuild the walls in the gates of Jerusalem, right? In Nehemiah chapter 3. So that tells us something, right? So maybe you are unsure you're gifting what God is calling you to do in your life. Maybe you don't think you have anything to offer, right? A goldsmith and performer could totally say that when it comes to rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, right? With wood and silver and gold. They don't know what to do with that. Well, goldsmiths would, but not with the wood part. So if that is you, remember Hanani in verse 8, right? You see, he was a performer by trade, yet he was still willing to get in there, get his hands dirty, and help do his part by repairing the part of the wall. So now if a performer can build a wall, then you also can help in some way in building up the church, right? So just because you don't have, you don't have a certain gift in, and the body's lacking in something, doesn't mean you can't contribute, basically. So... so. So what is we really saying about the church? I, I know what you you saying now about Nehemiah, these uh, uh, different peoples building this wall. Everybody didn't have the same talent. So now what is we saying about the church? So when we come to church, everybody don't have the same talent. But if we all work together, we'll make it work. But if we, you can tell when the body, when something wrong with the body, mm -hmm. you know. Just suppose the need is something wrong with. When the body come in, don't nobody even have to ask, is something wrong? Because you can tell by the way he walked. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So you can tell when one of the components of the church is wrong because you can tell how it's operating. You know, if you get the choir and the choir ain't, ain't, ain't together, you can tell it. So that's, that's the way I look at that. You can tell when... Something's going wrong. Mm -hmm. I'll let somebody else answer that question too, if y'all won't. But my answer to the question is basically um, it's the same application with Nehemiah chapter 3. Like, there, you don't see any construction workers. You don't see any uh, carpenters even. I don't see a carpenter in this text. Mm -hmm. Like, right? So basically, you don't see anybody that has the gifting and the skill and the calling and the profession of doing stuff with wood and gates and walls, right? So there's no builders here. Yet God used performers, you know, perform makers, Levites, priest helpers, priests, goldsmiths, governors, politicians, mayors, merchants, women, children, to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem in 52 days, right? So just because we're missing something, we don't have something, don't mean we can't do it. When all of us come together in Christ, in love, in the body, there's nothing we can't do, right? So. You see what it was, they were willing. You got to be willing to do something in church. Mm -hmm. Put yourself in a position where you can be used. Right. If you can't do nothing but make the mud to help, you know, help. Mm -hmm. Whatever you can do, no matter small or big, you do it. Right. And that's another thing, too. Like, it's whoever, whosoever will. Just like the Bible says, right? Whosoever will come, right? That's the way God operates. Does he look for the best? No, it's whoever is available. And same thing for Nehemiah. We see in Nehemiah chapter 4. Y'all said y'all went to Nehemiah chapter 4. Well, let's talk about Nehemiah chapter 2 first. When Nehemiah chapter 2, y'all remember at the very end, Nehemiah 
basically gave a motivational speak to the Israelites when he first got there. He said, you guys see the ruins. You guys see the gates down. You see the walls are burned, and you have been among ruins for 90 years. Let's get up and rebuild the walls. Let's stop living in disgrace and shame. And let's do what, let's glorify God by rebuilding the walls and show people how great God is. Because what walls down, what does that say? It says that our God ain't strong. Our God has no power. Our God's nothing. We've been defeated. We're living in disgrace and we're embarrassed. But should we be ashamed of the gospel? No. Like, should we be embarrassed about our God? No. Like, are you kidding me? We got to rebuild these walls. Let's get up and arise and rebuild the walls. That's what he said, I think, in verse 17 of chapter 2. So, uh, yeah, so he riled everybody, right? And it's whoever wanted to help. So did the nobles of Tokyo, did they stop the cost just because they didn't want to do the work? No. Other people stepped up. And other people were available. So God's going to use whoever he can use to get the job done. And does that mean the job's less than? It's not as going to be as great? It's not going to be as powerful? No. Like, the, we know in Nehemiah chapter 3 that the walls weren't as big as they were in David's time period and Solomon's time period, right? But does that mean they weren't as great? No. At least they got walls. Like, you know, they didn't have no walls and gates before that, right? So they have some, something better than nothing, right? So, yeah. But, you know, Nehemiah was giving his speech, but he wasn't no construction worker himself. Right. You know, but he motivated the people to bid it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If I may, oh, good. Uh, I'm just listening to the discussion. And if I just made, in particular, of the um, comment you just made, now when it comes to construction and, and, and building, I am no good. <laughs> but... Like you said, there's got to be somebody to motivate mm -hmm. the people. There's got to be somebody that is going to be the leader of the project, whether you know how to build the wall or not. You've got to have enough knowledge and abilities to lead the people, to inspire the people. And in this particular section, the idea of repairs, um, you know, the wall is built, and then you got the men to, and women and others to come behind to do the repairs. Um, you know, oftentimes in our churches, we build, but we don't necessarily repair. You know, if we could use the physical structure, for example. You know, we may do something every 20 years when the work needs to be done every year, maybe every month. The repairs got to be constant. And when we're talking about the people themselves um, in this particular text, if the idea of repair is to strengthen mm -hmm. and to encourage and to make something stronger, in other words. And I think that's where the question that you asked earlier, because we got to, to encourage one another. And whether there are those that are going to work or not like the nobles, they probably thought it was beneath them to get involved in this particular um, aspect of the work. But even if you got people who are above that think, you know, they're too good to do this. Now, as a pastor, you will discover that I'm the type of person that you may see me balconying, dusting, or whatever. I'm not the type that's going to say, this is your job and your job only, and I'm too good to do that type of work. But we're all in this together, and, and our job is to encourage one another and to make one another stronger. Even if it's the, the noble that think they are above that, what we do here may inspire them to do something. So we got to encourage and to strengthen each other and continue to equip one another yeah. with knowledge and prayer and so on. Some good stuff. I hope you guys are being blessed by this, man. This is crazy, right? Mm -hmm. You guys get it, man? Like, everybody had a humble heart. Like, where is, is your heart in the right place okay. when it comes to glorifying God, when it comes to his work? Because you're going to humble yourself a lot of times, I would say. Actually, every time you have to humble yourself. So all these people had to humble themselves. You know, a lot of people had to go distances just to do the work, right? We see the different tribes of Jerusalem came to do the work. And they had to come from, like Jericho. How far is Jericho from Jerusalem? Like they had to come a distance just to do this work, right? So they had to humble themselves and be willing to take whatever journey that they need to do God's work, right? So are you willing to do the same thing? Like, oh, yeah, so. But you know, uh, uh, nearby put God first before he even started doing anything. Mm -hmm. He put God first. Because it said he prayed for 40 days before he even talked to the king. So he had God on his side. So, you know, uh, and then the, uh, God 
changed the king's mind to let him do what he was going to do. Yeah. And then when he left, he had all the paperwork and all the, you know, just everything he needed. So all he had to do is, if I needed a con uh, contract to somebody to lay the concrete, all I had to do is find one of the, the king that gave me the order. I can get you to do what I need you to do. He just had to stay in contact with God. Mm -hmm. Mm. And that's something else, too. I like how you said that. Y'all remember how in Nehemiah chapter 2 at the very end, Nehemiah, it was Sam Ballot, Tobiah, and Geshem, right? They, all, they came, and they had an opinion about what they were doing. And they said, you shouldn't be rebuilding the walls. <laughs> and Nehemiah said, what is it to you? You have no part in this. You're not even one of, he basically said, you're not even one of God's people. You're not even one of God's <laughs> children, right? So what do you have to say about God's work and God's mission? You don't know. You don't know. So we're going to do the work. Whether how you feel or not, like it don't matter, don't right? Done. You have nothing, you have no part. That's what he said, you have no part in this work. So same thing with what you were saying, Brother brother Doyle, like, if you're not for us, you're against us, right? Like, if you're not part of the work and part of the solution and part of the answer, you have no, nothing to do with this, right? <laughs> we only going to work with people who are willing to do the work, right? Who want to serve the Lord. And same thing, like, basically I'm trying to say, guys, this is a huge application now. Like, it doesn't matter who leads. It doesn't matter who's a pastor. Work needs to be done, right? So are you using your gift and your, and your and are you, are you using your gifting, are you using your, uh, you guys get what I'm saying, talents and all that stuff for the building up of the body, for the building up of the church? Are you doing your part? Everybody has a part to play. We're a team, right? This Christianity ain't just a one show, one person doing something. Like, a lot of people, when it comes to a Bible text, they just focus on Nehemiah. De Nehemiah's name wasn't even mentioned in Nehemiah chapter 3. Right? It's everybody else that he mentioned. And actually, it's Nehemiah writing it. He's mentioning saying all these people did the work. He didn't even mention himself. That's humility right there. So, like, are you worried about glorifying yourself and doing the work? You want the recognition of praise? Nehemiah didn't even praise himself. He just said, these are the people that did the work. What did you do, Nehemiah? <laughs> we don't have to ask. We know what he did. Right? Same thing for you. Everybody's going to know what you did and what you did for the Lord. Even if they don't know here on earth, they're going to know in heaven, like we talked about with the Tokyoites, right? Like, yeah. your reward may not be here on earth, but it will be in glory, right? Storing up treasures in heaven. Everybody will know then. So it doesn't matter who knows now, right? It does not matter. We're doing it for God. And that's something else, too. The people didn't do this for Nehemiah. If they did, they probably would never even did it. Like, especially with all the opposition that they faced, all the threats that they faced from mm -hmm. Sinbad to Bai. Y'all saw that when Nehemiah chapter 4, right? So, uh, yeah, man, so what, what are you doing it for? Who are you doing it for? That, that really matters. Like, that's your identities, and that's going to keep you going. But let's keep on going, man. There's so much to talk about with this text. I want to talk about, I hope you guys saw this with the text, man. Like, I've been hearing a lot of messages lately and for years just on, like, your family is your first ministry. Family first, right? Stuff like that, right? So I want to talk about that, man. Like, when it came, to, I'm going to focus on Nehemiah chapter 10. I mean, Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 10. Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 23, and Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 30. When it came to these verses, it basically talked about how you need to make sure your own house is in order. You need to make sure your, your own house is in order before you do anything for God. Right? That's the first, your first ministry, your first task. A lot of people get it twisted, so let's talk about it. So it says in Nehemiah chapter 3, verse, again, verse 10, verse 23, verse 30, it says these things. It said, next to them, Jodiah, the son of Herameth, made repairs opposite of his house, right? That's the whole point. After them, Benjamin and Hesib carried out repairs in front of their house, right? After him, Hanani, the son of Shalima, and Hanan, the sixth son of Zelop, repaired another section. After him, Mushalim, the son of Barakiah, carried out repairs in front of his own quarters, right? So one of the things in this chapter we see reveals that it's often the workers the, the workers here in Nehemiah chapter 3 began rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem outside their home first, right? They did not think about others, and, oh no, they did think of others and knew that collectively they would contribute to the wall as a whole, yet individually they still wanted to make sure their own home had a solid wall of protection surrounding it. And that's so powerful that Nehemiah, when he was delegating a task, he's the administrator here, right? That's the Holy Spirit's task, by the way. Nehemiah symbolizes the Holy Spirit and how he gives out spiritual gifts and how he, he is over the whole operation of 
how the equipping of the saints and the operation and team effort goes, right? So that's Nehemiah's role. That's why his name's not mentioned. Is the Holy Spirit talk like and glorify himself? No. He points to the Son, right? So this is the text right here. So, uh, oh, go ahead. If I may ask you Yeah, go ahead. Um, in listening to what he just stated, and he talked about how each group, this group built, this group repaired, this group repaired, this group repaired, but he said they all did their work. What does that say? What is that saying? They all did their work. Anybody, what is that saying? Everybody that was in their group did their part. They did their part. But when they said, and to take it a little further, they all did their their, their part. Yeah. Hmm. You know, that's something to think about because, you know, if we look at the life of the kitchen, I mean the church, let's say it's the kitchen, and, and, and let's say the best singer in the church wants to be over the kitchen but can't cook. <laughs> Or, or, or the person that wants the solo is the best cook, but don't want the kitchen. Mm -hmm. They all did their work. <coughs> mm -hmm. And in order to do their work, we got to know our jobs. And sometimes we got to stay in our lanes. Because we all, as he said, we can't do it all. Can't no one person do it all. Everybody got to work together. They all did their work. Yeah. And I think that's the essence of it. You, you know, Dan over in there, uh, I listen to what he said. Uh, it says, do not overwork the man. Mm -hmm. And today's time, we want to put it all on one person to do what six should be doing. And to me, uh, that is what I would think would be overworking a person. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, every day and then Nehemiah would call them together and they would have a meeting. I guess they would tell them, well, we done got this far and we done did so far. And I think that's the way the church should run today. Yeah. Uh, where you should, Every so often, I don't know how often or anything, you should call them together and see if we are overworking a person. Uh, in today's time, in today's time, you know, our mind don't function as older people did. Younger people seem to have a different mindset than what older people say. And and it says uh, to me it says we should listen and do what so we don't over stress them out if they would say. Because yeah. these days and times they don't take anything to stress them out. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Don't it seem sort of ironic that uh, he let the people's work in front of their own houses. Rick, why did he do that? Yeah, that's what I want to talk about. <laughs> Can we go back to that? Just make sure to bring bring that back out, all right? I like how uh, Reverend Lawson talked about everybody has their part to play. A lot of people want to, you got to look, I, like, I love basketball, I love sports. So I like basketball and I like football. So I, everything basketball, football, I watch all the time. Mainly, I like pregame shows and postgame shows. I don't like even watching a game mm -hmm. unless there's two great teams playing. And first of all, I can only watch Steph Curry play because he's the only one that plays hard in the whole NBA and rallies everybody on his team and makes them better, and it's entertaining to watch. Mm -hmm. Before him, it was Kobe Bryant. Kobe Bryant, every single day, gave – every single game he played, he played yeah. like – he gave it at all because he knew that people came in the stands and paid all their money that they had just to come see him play one time. <laughs> and he knew that if he didn't show up and play, then it was for nothing, yeah. right? Because there's other people that gets motivation from his play. So he would score 40. I've never seen him score less than 25, ever. Like, the, all the games I watched. I watched every game just about that was on televised. So he, you guys know he scored like 50, 40, 60 points for like four months straight in like 2009. 
So, like, he was going off, right? This man was bad. But everybody wants to be a Kobe Bryant. Everybody wants to be a Michael Jordan. Everybody wants to be a great, right? But God calls some people not to be as great. But does that make them less great? No. Not if you play your role and play your part and do your part in the body, right? And what, what's the person that's great to talk about in the NBA, NFL, that just did their part and they ended up being great? And they weren't a Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, or somebody like that, right? I'm going to name one, Dennis Rodman. This dude is in the top 75. He ain't even score at all, right? Let me show you some of his stats. In a three-game three streak, this dude had zero points for three games straight. But he had 25 rebounds one game. He had 24 rebounds another game and 28 rebounds another. Like, what person in the NBA gets 24 rebounds, 28 right now, 30 rebounds? There ain't no person in the NBA doing that right now, none. Like, Dennis Rodman also, he was the greatest defender ever. Like, there's no argument with that. This dude would shut anybody down that he had to guard. Only because he got in their head, he would psych them out, he would just do stuff that would just get on your nerves, and that would give you a technical foul, and then Michael Jordan would go to the free throw line, straight buckets, right? You know, it's going in. Like, you're not going to miss a free throw, right? So everybody has a role to play. Without Dennis Rodman, the Bulls would not have won those last three championships, right? And it's not just Dennis Rodman. Who else did they have? Steve Kerr, right? They had Scottie Pippen, right? Some people look at Scotty like he ain't as great because he had Michael. What? Scotty was putting up numbers too. He was just as great as Michael, if not greater, right? So, like, these guys had a part to play, which made their jobs as a team easier when it came to winning, right? 72 and 10 is a pretty good record, right? It was the best record ever. But you guys get what I'm saying. Like, some people are called to be a Rodman. Some people are called to be a Scotty, right? These, those three people that I just named, Michael Jordan, Scotty Pippen, and uh, Dennis Rodman are all in the top 75 of all time, all greatest basketball players ever, out of like 5,000, right? So that's huge. So Eric, if you just do your part, if you just do your role as in the, in the part of the body, you're going to shine, right? Like everybody wants to shine, right? Everybody wants to be great. But in order to be great, what you got to be, what you got to do? You got to be great at your role. You got to do your job, right? You got to do your part. Dennis Rodman, Scottie Pippen, Michael Jordan, these guys showed up every game. Every game. They did not take a day off, right? So do you show up every game, every time we open the church doors, even when we don't open the church doors? Do you show up? Do you do something? Do you do your part? That's a heck to the no. No. Like, and we got to do that, right? In order to be great. In order to see God's work being done. Everybody wants to see God's work. Everybody wants to see the blessings, but you ain't willing to do the work. You kidding me? <laughs> You're not doing your part? And then it's not everybody doing the part, really. But we're going to see something, right? No. <laughs> you know, just like you were saying, I mean, and you, you, I like the way you're using basketball to break down what you were saying. You take uh, Steph Curry. Everybody can't be a Steph Curry. Right? No, ain't nobody can shoot like that. I mean, and you, <laughs> but the thing about it now, you got to understand, he had to put the work in to be able to do what he's doing. Right. Now, he got other guys on the team that like you was talking about there's Draymond Green. He might score you six points, but he's on the first team with Steph Curry, scoring 30 points. So they all got their parts to play. That's the same thing when it comes to the house of the Lord. Everybody got their part to play, just like the uh, uh, Brother Lawson was saying. Everybody might not be a good singer, but they can do good cook work. So if you ain't a great singer, cook something good. And then you go back to this wall, I don't forget which one of those guys it was. He didn't have no sons. But what did he do? I got some daughters. Yeah. I'm going to bring my daughters. They might not can put the big old logs up there, but they can show stir the bucket with the mud in it. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they can watch for the enemies coming. So they all played their role. Yeah. So that's all we have to do is whatever God tells us to do, play that role. Yeah. And the also, best you can. Right. And I also want to say, I want to bring this point home. Like, I hope everybody gets this. Like, we so worried about doing God's work out there or in the church, right? Like, everybody's focused on doing missionaries. Like, everybody's going to about missionary work. Like, going to Africa, Haiti, <laughs> Zimbabwe. They want to go all these other places instead of worrying about their own communities. 
right? Amen. Their own backyard. Amen. And not only that, their own homes and their own families. So I want to ask everybody a question. Is your family broken? Like, is your household broken? Is your relationships distorted and awful in your family? Amen. Did God not call us to love our neighbor as ourselves? Is not our family our closest neighbor? Right? So uh, a huge indicator, if you're a child of God, I would be, I'm just a bold statement too, but I'm a black and white type person. No gray areas, really. But you got to see the gray areas. What you guys going to say? <laughs> like, uh, it, it, when it comes to your family, right, like, your family should be your first ministry. And not only that, your marriage, if you're married, should be your first ministry. So how many broken marriages do you see? How many divorces do you see? Like, but, and then it'd be pastors, too. Like, your first role as a pastor should be what? Your family. <laughs> your family should be second to God. Like, right? But a lot of people put that on the back burner for their ministry for serving the Lord, right? And should that be the case? Now, honestly, it should be like a balance, right? You guys get what I'm saying? Like, everything has significance. Every, every area of your life has, has significance, right? We can't just disregard stuff and disregard the resources and the blessings that God's given to us and, oh, well, I'm going to focus on this. Like, no. As a believer, did Jesus do that? Like, no. <laughs> you know, and we're called to be like Jesus, right? So um, a lot of people are, I, that's my whole point. A lot of people are play-acting. Right? I talked about this with Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 through 8. That was one of my favorite Sunday school lessons I did with you guys. And basically, Jesus said, don't be like the Pharisees who, who uh, give to the poor just to be seen and to get a hand clap. Don't be like the Pharisees who pray out loud in front of everybody, in front of a window, so everybody can hear them. Right? To make themselves look good. That's their reward. Good job. Don't be like the Pharisees who who act and have a way of piety, you know, act in a certain way in front of people on Sundays, mm -hmm. right? But then Monday through Saturday, what do they do? Do everything. Do everything, right? Behind closed doors, are, they're not the same in private as they are in public. Is that the way of a Christian? No. Like, we're called to be authentic. We're called to, our hearts should be on our sleeves. You guys know what I'm saying? Like, on Sundays, we need to be the, we need to be the same way 24-7, Right? Especially behind in private. Jesus said, also in Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 to 8, you know, pray before your God in your closet, behind closed doors. Then you receive your reward. You know, give with your right hand and make sure your, right, your left hand don't know what your right hand is doing when you give. Because it should just happen naturally. That's basically what he's saying, right? You shouldn't even think about it, right? A lot of people do things just to be seen. They do things to get a reward. They do things for different reasons. They don't have the right motives and intentions behind what they're doing. In Nehemiah chapter 3, that's what we see, man. We see that Nehemiah assigned everybody to their house, right? And I was going to make a bold statement with you. I didn't say it, but here it is. The bold statement is, you know, if your house is messed up, apparently you're messed up, right? Because if you're a true believer, you're a salt and light of the world, right? What good is salt if it loses its flavor? Right? As a believer, you should have the most flavor out of anybody on earth that anybody has ever come across. Right? Because the Holy Spirit lives inside you. So when people come around you, they got flavor. Imagine life without salt. You know how bland and awful your food would be? Especially for a black person. We like flavor in our food, right? Our food has more taste than any other food in every, every, every single ethnicity ever. Right? So when we come across people, we need to have some flavor. Right? People should love being around us. Mm -hmm. Now, did the world hate Jesus? Yes. But did people love him? Yes, too. Like, they, they love being around Jesus more than anybody else. Come on. Right? So people should love being around you. Right? You should be a light to the world. Imagine li life without light. Are you kidding me? You walk in darkness. You're going to hit your toe on things. You're going to hurt yourself 24-7. Now you're going to know where to go. But you're called to be the light of the world. You should be guiding people on the path that they should be taking. You should know. Right? Because why? Because the Holy Spirit lives inside you. Right? So... It starts in our family. Family is your first ministry. This is what we get from Nehemiah chapter 3. What did he do? He assigned everybody to where they lived, basically. Mm -hmm. Unless they wanted to do extra work like the Tokiites and go to a different wall to help out, right, to close the gaps, like we see in Nehemiah chapter 3. I'll talk about that another time on YouTube channel. You got to check it out. But basically, he signed everybody to their households. Why? Because it gave them initiative to make sure the wall was perfect. Because if it wasn't perfect on that side where their house is, the enemy could come and take advantage of them on their side of the wall, right? And that's what's happening in our houses today, right? We ain't making sure that the repairs, like he said, we're, not make, we're, we're building it, but we ain't repairing it, right? 
We're half doing it, right? <laughs> and then also, guys, like, the walls are borders, like they're, they're uh, boundaries. They're, uh, there's, uh, the walls are, um, what you guys going to say? They're boundaries, right? Sometimes in life you got to set boundaries. You got to set restrictions for yourself or for your protection, right? This is what the wall symbolizes. So. When, when he put these people in charge of this wall, he must have knew who he was putting in charge. Yeah. He just didn't put in, he said, you did in your place to make sure this side of the wall got built. Your house. If you can't control your own house, you got a problem. Right. Yeah, and that's another thing. That's what I was going to say. Like, if your own house ain't in order, these are people you with 24-7, seven days a week. These are people you've been around for, uh, being around with for 50 years. And you have problems with them. Like, these are the people who know you the best. These are people who really know your heart. And they think you don't have Christ. So why would they come to Christ? That's a problem, right? Mm -hmm. So it starts in the household. You want to start reaching people for Christ, start in, start, start in your home. And I guarantee you start reaching even more people than what you thought. If you want to know why Scott's Chapel not growing like that? It starts in the home, baby. We had that at one point, and then it went away, right? So you want to get people back, start in your household, start in your home. Get, especially with your children. We saw that uh, a dude in the Nehemiah chapter 3 got his children to help with the work. Yeah. Train up a child in the way that he, sh he should go, and he won't depart from it. What did Joshua say? In my household, we're going to serve the Lord. <laughs> a lot of people, these parents today, they be giving their children opinions and letting them choose if they want to go to church. No! As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to go to church today. <laughs> See, it's an opinionated society we live in now. But you guys go on saying, like, it starts in the home, man. How you are outside of church is going to dictate what happens in the church, right? So we got to get our homes in order. We can't be like the Pharisees play acting. That's what a hypocrite is. It's a play actor, an actor, a pretender, right? Are you a pretender when it comes to God? Are you lukewarm? You're hot sometimes and cold sometimes? No, we need to be hot 24-7. We need to always be on fire for God. We need to always be doing God's work in our homes, in our jobs, in our communities, wherever we go. Right? Even when we go to the bathroom, we need to be glorifying God. Right? So, all right, yeah, you guys get it. All right, so, yeah, anybody else got something you want to say? Because I got a lot to say with just members of the body and stuff. All right, let's keep on going. Oh, we got 10 minutes. I can ask you a question. Go ahead. Do we love the whole body? Mm. And I'm going to say no. Because if you love the body, you would do anything for the body. Anything. And the body is the church, right? It's, it's all the members. Actually, it's more than just the church, more than just a building. It's all the members. So we're going to do everything it takes to take care of a member, right? Mm -hmm. and let's use an example, right? If, I, if something happens, I'm a baby when it comes to cuts and stuff. I take real precautions. So one of my pet peeves is a paper cut. Paper cut hurts. I can't stand paper cuts, man. So I'm real sensitive when I do anything with paper. So as soon as I get one, I'm like, ah, ah, like, you know, I'm freaking out. And it's my whole body's affected by that one little itty bitty cut you can't even see. Sometimes you don't even see it until you wash your hands. Lord help you if you put on hand sanitizer. That hurts even worse, right? So, like, <laughs> but it's a little cut that you can't see, and you finally see it, and then my whole entire body stops to tend to that one paper cut. I put alcohol on it. I put a Band-Aid on it. I t my whole body stops what it's doing to take care of that one part of the body that's hurt. Right? Mm -hmm. Do we do that as a church? Yeah. Like, come on, I mean, how many, the family, right? Family first is our first ministry. How many families need help financially? That's an example. How many people need help with alcohol and drugs and stuff like that? What are we doing to help them out? Like, there's a lot of people that are broken and going through some things. But, okay, what ministries do we have in place as the members of the body of Christ to meet those needs? It needs to be met. We need to put those roles and those functions in the body, right? We had it at one point. Let's just say it. Like, we had it at one point. Now we need to repair it and get it back going again. We need to rebuild that wall again, right? So you guys get what I'm saying. So, yeah, and I want to say, too, I want everybody to know this. One of my sermons I was going to preach here, y'all hear it on my YouTube channel and stuff when I do it at other churches and stuff. One of my sermons I was going to preach is, you know, every single member of the body is important. Every single member in the body is vital. Every single member in the body is necessary. And so many people don't feel like they have any type of gift or, any, or can do anything for Christ because they look at other people and their spiritual gift and it's like, man, they're so good. And now I'm going to use some examples. You got Sister Nisi when she sings. Well, I can't sing like Sister Nisi. That's not 
You know, when Pastor Jenkins preach, or you know, when I talk, you know, I can't talk like that, you know. But what can you do that we can't do? I know it's something, right? And if you don't know what that is, that's that's why you need to in private spend time with God and figure out what how He gifted and called you to be used in the body. That's on you to figure out in the body to edify you enough to show you what your gifts are. So it's really a two-way street, right? So all, all parts of, of every single person's body are important, right? Thereby, you are important to the body of Christ. I want to throw that out. Go ahead. <laughs> the, whole, the whole body is important. But you know there is a certain part of the body that you can do without. Mm. <laughs> there is a certain part of the body that you can't do without. Mm -hmm. So there is a difference. So it's just like the church. I guess if you got some members in there just raising a bunch of, you know what, you don't really need them. Yeah. And that, that's just my saying. That. And I would say, I would say too, I heard that before. But then the devil's advocate to that is, yeah. you know when a member's missing when they're you can gone. Tell when they gone. And a good example is if your big toe, your big toe is so tiny, right? Do y'all know what would happen if one of your big toes missing? You're not going to be able to walk. It throws, your balance. it throws your balance off. So the whole body's affected from that one toe missing. The littlest body member. Another example. Paul talks about 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I love, it's probably my favorite chapter in the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He talks about how, like, you know, the inward parts of your body, the parts that are not glamorous, the parts that are uncomely, like the parts that are disgusting, those are the most important members. Why? Because you can't do it without your heart. No. Your heart functions and the blood flows and all the veins are connected to the heart. Like with, you got the without your heart, you'll die. You got the and then all the members start working. Right? Not to mention, not only your intestines, I don't know what it's called right here. The intestines that be like this. Right? Like what's gonna happen if they if they're gone? I don't even know. But you, I don't want to know. <laughs> you know. And then the lungs. I know you can do it without one, but you got two for a reason. I don't know why. But like, you know what I'm saying? Like Everything is significant inside your body, the parts that are hidden. So how many parts in the body of Christ in Scott's Chapel in any church are hidden that needs to be uh, taken care of, that needs to be shown attention to, that needs to be tended to? You guys get what I'm saying? Like, it, hopefully nobody does this, but you should be taking care of your inside of your body as much as you take care of the outside of your body. A lot of people put emphasis on working out, looking good on the outside like a Pharisee. Right? What do you do for the inside of your body? You can look all good you want, but if you just smoke and eat McDonald's, I'm telling you now, the inside of your body is going to look like crap. And that's not good for your heart, your lungs, your brain. Your brain needs fruit, just by the way. Blue, blueberries, I think, or blackberries. But you guys get what I'm saying. So uh, let's close out, man. I hope everybody's being blessed by this. Real quick, to go back to what Brother Doyle stated about the group that raises Saying, let me just well say, raise his hand. And, and, and he said that we may not need them, but let's go back to what we said a little earlier. What is our job, everybody, to do what? To strengthen, to encourage, to build up, to bring everybody along, mm -hmm. even those that's going to keep the noise. We got to be the living examples. We don't have to argue just because somebody else argues. And we don't have to fuss and raise Cain because somebody else does. But we got to let our light shine <laughs> so that others will see good works and glorify the Lord. Amen. So even that group that we may think is of no good, we can encourage them and they may surprise us. Mm -hmm. There's going to be nobles. There's going to be nobles in every group. <laughs> and the nobles are those who we don't know why they act the way they do. And it's not our job to try to change them. Because if God can't change some folk, I don't know what we think we can do. But we can still be the examples. And to love them in spite of them. And my grandfather used to say from the pulpit, just love the hell right out of it. <laughs> and y'all gonna see I'm a very direct person and very, and very open person. But um, we gotta love anyhow. And you know, and as 
each member of the congregation, we all probably got somebody that we know can't stand us. And we probably can't stand them. Mm -hmm. But we got to love anyhow. <laughs> Amen. And that's not always easy. It's easy to love God. But, the, but we say it every Sunday, love the Lord with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, and in your strength, and in love one another as you love yourself. We repeat it. But do we understand what we're saying in that second command? Mm -hmm. Scripture says it's easy to love God. But what about your haters? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about them? And I know we say everybody loves me, but we all got some haters. Mm -hmm. right. So we got to love them. And my prayer every day, even my haters. Because your haters do what? They will keep you on your knees. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, I want to close it out, guys. Like, it takes everybody. I hope everybody, this is everybody's takeaway. God's kingdom needs the involvement of the whole entire community, right? As demonstrated by the representatives of the crafts, different trades, neighboring towns, and all the social classes that came together to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem to get this job done in Nehemiah chapter 3. That hasn't been done for 150 years since the Babylonians took them captive. They've been back for 90 years, right? 70 years before Nehemiah, the temple was rebuilt, but yet they were in ruins. This is an assignment that had to be done. That wasn't done for 150 years, guys. They've been back for 90. You guys get that? And God used one man. I'm pretty sure everybody else had the same motivation. But he used one man who took initiative, who made a plan, who prayed, and said, okay, I wanna, I'll, I'll be willing to be used, God. There's a lot of people that God probably called to do this. But only one person got the job done. That's Nehemiah. With all the people coming together, right? So that's my whole point, man. Like, at Scott's Chapel, we got to work together. Good a good way to know if you're a child of God, can you work with the other members of the body? That means you're a part of the body if you can, right? You don't see my lungs contradicting my, well, it shouldn't, but you guys get what I'm saying. My one lung ain't going to try to fight the other lung saying, give me, I should have power over this body. Like, you know, no, we got to work together in order to make sure Sean, the whole entire body, is functioning correctly. It's the body of Christ. It ain't your body. It doesn't matter what you want. It's what Christ wants. He's the head, Amen. right? He's the brain operating everything, right? We're just going to do our roles and do our function and do our job, right? So everyone in the body is needed, right? When it comes to a God vision, a God dream, it will take everybody. It will take everyone to be willing to get their hands done, to be willing to be humble themselves and do any kind of job that needs to be done for the body. Just like we do for our own bodies when a paper cut shows up or something like that, right? We get cancer, we're going to do whatever it takes to get rid of it, right? So, same thing for us, man. So, this, Nehemiah chapter 3 is a great example of what kind of work that can be accomplished when God's people work together to fulfill God's plan. If you're part of the body, you're going to do whatever it takes to get the job done, right? If not, you're going to keep on fighting the body and saying, the job don't need to be done. We just could do that. No, it needs to get done, guys. So, that's Nehemiah chapter 3. You guys, go to my YouTube channel. Check out more at Upload Pass Crossroads. But I love you guys, man. Thanks for... All the studies and letting us change up how we do Sunday school. I pray you guys loved it, man. So, all right, that's the Sunday school lesson. All right, we want to thank our brother Sean for his for his teaching. Uh, I was sitting back there, and I, and I as as I mature in life, I sit down a lot. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, it said it says uh, this kind of like you know going. Going back to about the body of Christ. And then it says in Ephesians 4 and 2 says, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bear with one another in love. If we don't have love in us, how can we bear with one another? So we've got to learn how to do that. Make every effort, I mean every effort, to keep the unity of the spirit through the bonds of peace. So you know, that's Ephesians 4 and 2. It kind of ties in with what we're speaking about. Any comments, uh, Brother Lawson? You got comments? Okay, uh, if our hearts and minds are, are finished, we'll stand and be dismissed. And all together, uh, the, the grace, grace of, of our Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ be with us all. Amen. Amen.